Hello, my name is Stepan Kvitensky. I work for Accolade, which is an American company uh, that is in the healthcare uh, concierge space. Uh, and I work uh, for the office that, that's uh, based in Prague. Today, we are not going to talk, uh, to talk about what is continuous delivery and what, what is not continuous delivery. Uh, I would rather uh, want to share with you some of the experience that I went through while trying to start with continuous delivery. And hopefully you will be able to find out uh, something that will be useful for you in case that you're in, in position that you want either to start with continuous delivery or, or make it better uh, at your company. Or you are just thinking about maybe that's a, that, that's a good, good uh, way to, uh, to choose and to go. Uh, oops. And yes, that's the other one, sorry. There are two very similar ones. And yeah, there we are. Uh, before I go to that, uh, to give you the context, I would like to share what my journey looked like. So maybe you will be able to somehow connect the dots uh, with either your experience or why I have done some of the, thing, uh, some of the things uh, the way that, that I have done them. I'm in software development engineering for about a uh, little bit longer than, than 10 years. I started as a, as a tester, and uh, throughout the years, uh, I ended up uh, in, in, in doing a software design engineer for uh, tools that support test automation and automation in general. Uh, I learned about continuous delivery, I think, roughly around five years ago. And I have to say, I immediately fell in love with that. And for me, that was like, yes, this is the way how, how software should be done, and, and no other way is right. So I'm, I'm a little bit uh, yeah, exaggerated in, in, in continuous delivery. I'm, I'm like an enthusiast, yeah, you, you might say. Uh, though I'm not, uh, I'm not like a continuous delivery consultant that would go from company to company and help them up start it. Uh, so it, it's really more like personal experience from what I was able to, to do at the companies that I worked, uh, that I worked with. So it's going to be very, like I would say, uh, personally tied to, to my experience. Uh, can I have your hands up who has ever seen this book? It's not that much. How many of you that, that, that have seen it ha have actually read at least few chapters from that? Uh, we're there. Anyone who read it cover to cover? Like the whole book? Oh, I got one. Uh, cool. Uh, Jess Humble and David Farley, uh, they have coined the, the term continuous delivery uh, somewhere around 2010. And uh, by the way, uh, you who, who wrote the, the, the full book, do you think that, that Jess and David, they are something like gods of continuous delivery? No. No? no. Uh, do you think they are masterminds at least? Yes. Yeah, okay, cool. Glad we're uh, on the same page there. I, I think they, were, they are really uh, great thinkers uh, by being able to basically take the concept of continuous integration and move it, uh, move it further and, and, and evolve it. As I said, uh, the book has been published in, in 2010. Uh, I, I have to say there is still a lot of things that are still valid today. So the, the, the basic principles, they still stand. Even though, to me personally, continuous delivery changed a little bit in uh, in, in things like we have now much better adoption of feature flagging. So previously to me, there was, it was more for the technological organizations how to move faster. Nowadays, it, it also encompasses the other side of the house, the, the, the business side of the house, and gives them more power, uh, well, gives more power to, to their hands. Uh, they are a little bit more self-served, uh, we can say. Uh, so how, what I'm going to uh, speak about, uh, when I was uh, putting together the talk, I was thinking how, how to put those little shards that I got from like, oh, this is how it works, and, and make it into something that, that would make sense for you, how to group those things together. Uh, so I went into 
uh, the internet and I searched like how transformations are done and I have found out that when you're doing a digital transformation, which to me like adopting continuous delivery is nothing else than transformation, uh, you have three, uh, three uh, areas that you need to focus on. I, that's people, process, and uh, technology. So I said, well, maybe I can put those shards that I have and, and put them into the same, into the same areas uh, together so it will make sense for you. So we will get through those three areas and, and then I'll open to questions. Uh, but first, a little disclaimer. Uh, people are are very diverse and that makes uh, continuous delivery or adoption of continuous delivery really hard because as everyone is different, like uh, even, even the teams are different and companies are different. It's, uh, when, when you're looking at, at how, to, how to get continuous delivery into, into a company or into your team, it's not the same as if you were in the same situation in, in different company. And to me, that, that's also what, what really drives me with, with continuous delivery, because it's so much fun trying to find out which way would work in the different situation. So what I'm going to be talking about, it's not like that you can copy paste and apply to your team and it would work. But you might find out some parallels or principles that you can adopt. Uh, and, and and use uh, for yourself. Okay, let, let's get to the people section. Uh, first lesson learned. Uh, I have uh, I have startup uh, started with a continuous delivery with, with really small small team. I, I was leading team of four. Uh, we were doing some uh, tools automation support. And I was really lucky that I got product owner that was really into continuous delivery as well. And he said, like, we are working on a new project. Let's start to make it properly. Let's, let's have continuous delivery in there. So with the team, we started to look around what does it mean, how we need to think about coding, how we need to think about deployments in order to get into continuous delivery. Uh, then I moved to another job, to my current one. And I worked for a very similar team, basically also uh, making uh, tools and frameworks to support, uh, support automation. And uh, I have talked about continuous delivery since I was passionate about it. I, I, I talked to our architects and they were like, well, this, this sounds really great. Like, maybe we can do it. Will you lead it for us? And I was like, yeah, that, that's awesome. I'm, I'm going to be like the continuous delivery consultant. Great, let's do it. I have some experience. Well, was totally different uh, than, uh, than with the small team. I have learned that uh, by like hard, some hard failures. Uh, but the thing that I have learned is that you need to be patient. Uh, with the previous team, with the small team uh, that I worked in the, in the previous company, it was kind of everybody was very similar minded. So everyone kind of said, yes, we want to do this, let, let, let's do this. And every single person on the team started to think about this is how we are going to do it. In current position, that's a little bit different because I'm part of a team that, that's working on, on something and in something that I will call like a spare time, I'm trying to help the company to, to switch, uh, switch over. So it's not my uh, like primary focus on switching accolades to continuous delivery. It's really like I have my primary assignments and let's say one of them or like side, by, side to the primary assignments, I'm helping out with, with the continuous delivery. So what you really need is patience uh, because it's going to take time. Uh, the most interesting point in continuous delivery is that the people need to start differently about how they think about the coding. And you are going to approach the teams, especially if you're like external from the team and, and you're going to approach them and say like, hey, we should be doing continuous delivery and this is what it means. You're 
basically attacking their status quo. You, you're attacking how they are doing things until now, and it's working for them perfectly, but maybe it's not gonna be working for them in the, uh, for the speed that you want to achieve within two years. So you need to start to preparing them to start thinking about what we are doing now is good, but we should get better. And this takes time. Uh, some people are more eager into like, yeah, we want to release more faster or we need to push more uh, faster. Some people are like, we're okay with what we have at the moment. So uh, that's, that's, I guess, the biggest lesson learned at the people section for me is that you really need to be patient uh, because it, it really takes time. Some other examples of what you will uh, be, be at, like, how people need to ch switch the, the thinking is with continuous delivery. Uh, it's be, to me, it's something like uh, test-driven design uh, uh, on steroids. For your pipelines to work, you need to write your code, but you also, at the very same time, you need to write uh, some tests or you, you, well, either automate it or, or prepare test cases that you will run as a part of the pipeline manually later, but you need to think about the whole thing when you're designing, which is totally different to somebody who's used to waterfall model and he said like, okay, this is like how I code it and then somebody else will do it. That's not the case for continuous delivery. Usually it's the same team that needs to do all that stuff. So it's really similar to, for me, to agile transformation as well. Like you need to turn, steer the people to, to start looking totally different way on things they are doing. The next uh, biggest impact was, uh, who's your customer? So I went into, into that, like, yes, I'm, I'm going to do that for you. Uh, I went to VP of engineering. They said, that, yes, we want to do it. I, I was like, oh, yes, these are my customers. These are the ones that want uh, us to be delivering much, much quicker. And then the teams are going to be my customers in, like, those will be the ones that I need uh, to, to give advice and help them with what, what they need to change. The thing that I haven't realized is that there is the other side of the house, there is the business side of the house, which might really not be happy with getting new code every single day. Actually, the truth is they are really anxious about getting new code every single day, especially if they were used for like monthly releases you're disturbing their world, which is tightly tied uh, to your company revenue, and they won't allow you to do that. So you need to start with your, whoever your, your business or customers are, but it's definitely not the technology organization. To me, the parallel would be like the technology organization is like the engine that, that's producing something, but the business side of the house is, is they are the ones they are, that are driving the car. So examples from, from my uh, experience were like, for example, our business, uh, whenever they got the, the new, stuff, uh, new stuff delivered, they had to train all the operators and those trainings took from day to one week. In case that you want to make those deployments, the, those new features, uh, get, getting new features to them faster, they were like, oh, but we need to train those people. We can't let you, let us, let, let you give us code more often than like once a week because otherwise our operators would be just on the trainings and they wouldn't be doing the operations as they should, which is the thing that, that drives the revenue and produces money for us. So you need to look into what are the restrictions from business side and look into what continuous delivery uh, can give you and architect the final solution around that. So you can use, for example, feature flagging to, to uh, distinguish between deployments, uh, deployments and releases um, and make sure that, that you don't disturb your, uh, your, you don't disturb your uh, business day of life. The other thing 
that I have discovered very soon is that even in the community around the world, there is this term continuous delivery, there is the term continuous integration and continuous deployment. Some people think those terms are interchangeable and use them that way. Uh, but that uh, really creates confusion between people because continuous delivery isn't the same thing as continuous deployment. And I use the terms as, as just humbly uh, uses them. So basically it means continuous delivery is something that uh, makes you as owner of the code sure that whenever you want to uh, deploy that to production, this piece would work. That's what continu continuous delivery does for you. Same as continuous integration is like whenever you add a new piece of code, it will work well with the rest of the code base. Uh, and continuous deployment is basically having everything automated so you just commit and it goes all the way into production and is available uh, to your user. So what you need to do whenever you encounter that two, two people or two groups are, are communicating regarding continuous delivery and they are interchanging those terms, you should go there and, and fix fix the vocabulary so everybody understands what it exactly means to, to do continuous delivery. Example would be like uh, I told our, our technology group, let's go and do continuous delivery. And they were like, yeah, yeah, let's do it. That, that's great. But then they were coming back with like continuous delivery is too hard. We don't want to do that. For us, it's just enough if we can deploy during daytime. And they totally didn't get that continuous delivery is exactly about that, about being sure that you don't disturb your, your business and you can actually deploy during daytime. The other thing that I have mentioned a little bit with the feature flagging is there is a difference between code deployment and release. Uh, usually from the old days, whenever we said we are going to release, it meant that you are going to have immediately the new features. While with continuous delivery or, or adopting continuous delivery, you are going to change that a little bit. So you are going to <coughs> make, uh, make deployments which doesn't necessarily change the, the behavior of your application. Uh, who is especially anxious about that is business because Whenever you released, you changed the behavior of the application previously. So how comes it's, it's, it's different now? So you will have to tell them like what's the differences in the, uh, between those new, in those new mechanisms that will make sure that whenever you deploy new code, their day of life will remain the same. And it's going to be after some time when, for example, they decide they want to switch the flag and change the behavior. Um, that it's going to be different. And uh, to me, it, it's like uh, building a highway bridge. In standard day, you don't even think about it. Like you're going on the highway and they want to build a new bridge. They just start to build a new bridge in there in piece by piece. And you don't really care because you're still driving your way and everything works for you. And once the bridge, bridge is fully built, then they just shift the traffic, then you just go over the new, new bridge. And like that, this is completely normal for us. No one thinks about, well, can I really go on the old bridge before the new bridge is built? If it's like being built in there, it's not like that they would come and put the whole bridge like all at once there, right? For business, this is like, I, I don't get why for software, uh, software, um, design or, or software delivery, this is so, so much different. It's basically very similar, right? We, uh, when we build the software in a way that, that, we, can, whoops, that, that we can say that uh, uh, the old bridge is still fully functional, but we're just adding something that you just don't see, they are anxious uh, about that for, for some reason. Uh, but if it's like a civil engineering, they don't they are not that anxious. So I guess we just need to somehow persuade them that it's, it's the very same thing 
and they don't have to be anxious as long as you have the, the right continuous delivery mechanisms in place. Another thing about, uh, about continuous delivery is that your teams are, as I said, they are going to be different and they are going to move in a different speed. And that's perfectly fine. Since those teams are diverse, some of them would be more eager to, to, to adopt continuous delivery and work much harder on it. Some, some, the others would have maybe some critical features they need to deliver, and then they, don't, they wouldn't have time to transform just yet. That's perfectly fine. It doesn't make much fuss around the, the technology, but it, it usually makes fuss around the higher level management because they usually want to have everyone in the same, in the same boxes, like everyone is doing the, way the, sa uh, uh, the, the same way. So again, you will have to spend some time with the high level management to explain that, that being different throughout the teams isn't actually bad, it's actually good, because it's gonna work much better than if you would come and say, now this is the way how you're doing it, without understanding why we are doing the way. Uh, why we are doing the thing uh, differently. And last but not the least, uh, you need the supporters. Obviously, when you want to start with like changing your team or company, you need to have a supporter that has enough power uh, and that is looking at it the same way as you are, that, that he wants to get into, into continuous delivery. Uh, that happened to me, so I, w I was kind of lucky. Our, our VP of engineering, they said like, yes, obviously we want to do that. L let's go and let's do it. So I, I, got the sub uh, I got the supporters that got enough power in order to, to, to move the, steer the company's ship. Uh, but more importantly, you will need uh, the other supporters, uh, like this guy, which are actually not just like cheering for the continuous delivery, but they are turning to the others and, and like cheering them up even more for you. Uh, those are usually find within the teams and those will be your single point of contacts for that specific teams. And they will, uh, it, it has basically mutual benefit. These are the ones that you will be instructing or working with the most because they are going to amplify what, what, what you're saying into their team. And they are gonna follow up. And on the other hand, they are going to be the ones that are going to tell you, hey, this is not working for us. Uh, so it's good to, good to find them early. Uh, one of the things that worked for us, at Accolade we have something that we called uh, that we call community of practice, which is basically gathering of people that are like uh, thinking about um, doing some transformation or, or want to share um, stuff around some specific technology. So we have like, like Java community of practice and we have CI CD community of practice. And after a few of them, after a few of those gatherings, those people crystallized up. Those are the ones that are always appearing in there. They are always asking questions. Those are the ones that you need to target and pair up with uh, in order to, to be able to be successful. Okay, uh, let's get into the, into the process part. When teams that have never seen continuous delivery, have never read the continuous delivery book, are going into the continuous delivery, for them it's basically like an unexplored land or unexplored island. So when I was thinking about like, how can I help those people without actually having to be in there every single day so they will be able to somehow use their pace and get slowly towards uh, the, the continuous delivery? Like, how can I help them? And uh, one thing that, that came into my mind, and I was kind of lucky because at the very same time, I, I got, a, I got a mentor, into a mentorship program, and I got with my mentor, uh, together, and he said, okay, what you, want to, what you want to improve? And I was like, well, those few things, uh, let's say it's gonna, be, it's gonna be speaking at the conferences. And he say, he, he told me like, okay, but that's like, I, okay, I get it. You want to improve that, but how? So he introduced me into a very simple framework, which was draw three columns. In the column on the very left, 
put like what's your current state. Into the column on the very right, put what is the state that you want to achieve. And then you have this one column in the middle that's empty originally, and there you put all the steps that you will do in order to, to get from the current state into the to be state. And this very simple framework actually really works very well because it's no longer I just want to improve in that or I, I, I want to improve in that, but it's, it, it gives you like a checklist of things that you, that you need to follow in order to really achieve, achieve your goal. And I said, well, maybe I can use something similar, but for continuous delivery. So I used this framework. I merged it with the maturity, continuous delivery maturity model from the book, which says like there are there is several levels of, of maturity of continuous delivery, and it has this little uh, nice matrix that that says like from bottom bottom up it, it's like the you're really not good and you're 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 the best or you you can just like only improve a little bit here and there, and it like targets like the things how the things look like, so it's like our as is and to be columns, but we're still missing the how to get there. So I put those two together and created something like that, which is a matrix of things that needs to be achieved. The blue columns are the states. Uh, the rows are different disciplines that you need to, that you need to cover with co continuous delivery. And then the, the white columns are actually the to get their steps. So how the thing can use it? It basically goes to that framework, look at the metrics, said, okay, this is the stuff that we want to improve. For example, let's, let's take logging. And they, they pick the line. Then they go and look into the blue columns and, and check like, what is my current state? So they read those little bullet points, and if they are fulfilling all of them, they are definitely in that state. So they go left to right from the, the, the lowest level up to the highest one. And whenever they find a state that there is some bullet point that is not fulfilled, they identify the, their to be state. And then they go to this little cell in the middle that says like these are the steps that you need to do in order to get to the next level. And it can be, uh, you need to adapt some li uh, shared libraries, you need to uh, set up your inter infrastructure in order to send the logs into some common sharing, uh, uh, sharing uh, infrastructure of logs and all other kind of things. Those are already tied to, to how we do things in Accolade. So it's not like that they would open the book and find out, okay, what I need to do with the logging, but that, that's just a basic principle in the book and you won't have the, the things how we do it at our company. So this is really tailored to how our company does stuff. Uh, the other thing that you can get there, because like if you would have this, the, the book has like, 300 pages. So if you would really want to put there like how things need to be done, this metrics would be enormous and nobody would read it. So instead of that, there can be links to something that we call CICD recipes, which is, uh, you can imagine that similar to standard cooking recipe. So what we have done in there is that we say, for example, blue-green deployment. There is a recipe for how to do blue-green deployment at, at Accolade, and it starts with like, this is what blue-green deployment is, so everybody understands what they are trying to achieve. There is um, uh, a, a little section about the theory of the, of the blue-green deployment, then there is a section like a, a playbook on what you need to do with your, let's say, uh, service, what you need to do with your service, in order to, to, to have blue-green deployment uh, applied. And then you can have something like, if you're really interested in blue-green deployment, those are the for, for the links or uh, conference talks or another resources that you, that you should, should go and investigate. And this really helped with starting people that, that weren't thinking about anything from continuous delivery before, and they were like always just saying, the book is too thick, we can't like just read it. This, like, you're serving it in, in little portions, and, and it somehow automatically gets into the team's, uh, team's mindset. So that really helps. Last piece, the technology. Uh, there are 
few things that, 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 that you can do in order to help, peop, uh, help the teams move uh, faster. One of them are some templates. But be careful because templates can bite you back quite a lot. That happens to us. So what we have done, and that's something that I called like a static template, is that we said, okay, if we want our team to get into continuous delivery, they need to have, uh, have properly defined the pipeline. So we created a template that actually defines the pipeline for them, and they just fill it, fill it in. Uh, uh, for a new project, they just fill in uh, the parameters that are related to the project, and it creates the pipeline, the whole pipeline definition for them accordingly to like what we believe is the latest and greatest standard. Up to that, that that's perfectly fine. For green slate um, project, that works perfectly. The problem comes with the teams might do some things a little bit differently, and they start to adjust the pipeline, and then we found out, okay, maybe we have done something wrong, so we changed the template, but you can't really have the team just to delete whatever they have customized in there and just use the template again, because they would lose their customization that might be really uh, specific just to that team and, and are perfectly valid in the pipeline. So it generates something like a technical depth, and I still don't have great solution uh, for this. Things that I had in mind is like maybe we can version those templates and then we can uh, also store the parameters that the team used when, it, when they were uh, creating the Head Start pipeline. And then run the same set of parameters on the new version and then just compare like what's different and they should know what, what, was the, what is the customization and what not. But it's a lot of work. Uh, so rather than that, uh, it's better if you can use something that I call dynamic templates, which you can imagine something like a, uh, like a runtime template. So instead of basically bootstrapping the project uh, with the pipeline definition, you, you bootstrap it with the pipeline definition that doesn't look like it's, it's all in there, but parts of the pipelines that look the same, like deployment into, into environment, are basically just another template placeholders, and when you run your pipeline, they're going to be filled in. This works uh, a little bit better, because whenever you, you find out that you need to change the way how you deploy, deploy into your environments, the next run of the pipeline will have it automatically for them. So those are much better for the technical depth, but much harder to, uh, to maintain, obviously. Same as the shared libraries, which are like the next steps of those uh, dynamic templates, which is the things that, that you would put into place so everybody doesn't have to write the very same code to uh, do something before the deployment uh, happens, but they just reuse the code. Same like we do libraries for, for the, the product itself, we should have the same libraries for the pipeline definition or steps within those pipeline definitions. So we, we prevent copy-paste and we keep the pipelines actually maintainable when you find out that you have been doing something wrong. And I can guarantee you, you will find out you have been doing something wrong and you need to change that. And imagine if you have, like for us, we have something around 200 pipelines. If you would have to go into 200 repositories and, and change that, and you can't script it because maybe some teams have changed it a little bit to what they needed. If you would rather have that step done through a, a library that everybody is reusing, obviously when then you change the, the, the library, everybody has the step uh, done in a, in a new way without having to update all those 200 pipelines. The downside of it, or well, let's not say downside, but the, the requirement to such libraries is that they need to be top-notch quality. So in, in such case that, that you are going to develop such, uh, such uh, libraries, and we did, you need to, how they say it in, in some companies, you need to drink your own champagne. So those libraries should have the full fledged continuous delivery in place before you start to use them in pipelines of everyone else. Because if not, and you're, you, sorry for the word, you screw something up, you basically screw the whole company and they won't be able to deliver their software. And they will, they will come and, and literally kill you, I, I think. So you want to prevent that. And in case uh, 
you're not able to fix it uh, quickly enough, you should have good rollback mechanisms in place that, that will be all, almost instantaneous. So whenever there is a problem, you can roll back to previous version that was proven to be working. Few points around the CI CD engines. I happened to be part of picking, picking the new CI CD engine for Accolade when I joined. When we were like, yeah, we want to go into continuous delivery, but we still didn't have much experience with it. Uh, so I gathered five points, uh, which uh, I personally think are really important when you're going to pick up a CI CD engine if you don't have one and you want to, to, to pick a new one, those five points are the ones that you should look into. Uh, number one, good visibility into your pipelines. This is my biggest mistake that I have done when we were choosing that engine, because our VP of engineering came and he said, I want to have overview of like every single team. I was like, yeah, that's easy. We just need something that is able to show all the pipelines that because the pipelines are reflecting how the team is doing and you're there. But like what you see on the picture there is just not even one tenth of the pipelines that we have. It's just like, what, maybe 20? And we have 200. Uh, so if you have something that, that is able to display all the pipelines, it's completely unusable because from that overview you can't tell what's going on. You might be able to see that there is something wrong but you're not able to, to tell anything. So you would have to really uh, zoom in, zoom in, zoom in and then click on the, the stuff to find out what's going on. So, so don't focus on being able to display pipelines for the whole, for the whole company or even don't, don't display all the pipelines for the whole team because there might be also if they own like 20 to 30 microservices, this like high level overview is not giving you any value. So rather than that, look for uh, specific uh, features around the dashboarding, being able to, to uh, compose really highly customizable dashboards that are able to show you, in case there is something wrong, they are able to show you that within seconds. That's much more helpful and, and having like filtering abilities on those dashboards as well uh, for example, like if you want to see what's the current state of your production environment, you will just filter it out and it'll show you like all those steps that are related to, to production, much better than trying to display the whole pipeline. Obviously, sometimes it's really useful to be able to see the whole pipeline, uh, just to see like what are the steps that we are doing in order to be able to deliver stuff into production. Uh, but there are much better use cases for more deep dive dashboards than that. Number two is infrastructure support. Obviously, like when we were going into that, we got some cloud provider. Uh, we asked whether we are going to be locked in. The answer was yes, and we were okay. So we are looking for this specific cloud provider support in our CI CD engine, and that, that's it. So we found out those, and by Going through through that through like a year later, we found out that the support was there, but we started to want uh, uh, to to do things a little bit differently than what the CI/CD engine actually supports, because it really depends on who is creating the, this CI/CD engine and what is his philosophy around continuous delivery. Again, it can be a little bit different to what's your philosophy. And they can have, for example, different implementation for blue-green than what you want, would like to achieve. So you need to look into not only if it supports your, your either cloud provider or, or like deployment into your um, uh, data center, but you need to look into how specifically it supports uh, that. Like what is, the, what is the connections that it can do? What are the mechanisms that it uses? And, and Try to identify whether you're okay with such mechanisms or whether you want something more. So you need to spend a little bit more into uh, piloting or prototyping uh, your deployments in the new tool before you actually say, okay, this is the tool for us. 
Number three, pipeline definition. Uh, from the small team experience, like we came up almost instantaneously, we want to have pipeline as a code because if anything happens, we'll just like spawn it up again from the Git repo, the pipeline will be there. We might, might lose the history, but, but we'll have the, the new deployment uh, available within a few seconds in, in the en engine. So I was looking into, okay, our new CI CD engine needs to have pipeline as a code. What I haven't realized, again, that the teams might be different and not everyone is from day one comfortable with having pipeline as a code. Some people really like to go, especially UI developers, they really like to go into the tool and put the thing together within the, within the few clicks because they don't need to really understand how that trans, transform in, into something like that. That would be like few clicks on the UI, but in the code, it's totally different. They need to go into the documentation. So make some investigation around your teams, how they would like to define the pipelines if, if they have an idea. And if, don't, if, if they don't, then you need to count with, you will have to prepare lessons or trainings for them uh, to be able to, to uh, create the pipelines. Uh, the other thing is, uh, some of those engines wouldn't allow you to actually display the pipeline b before it's committed and applied, which for people that are not used to continuous delivery, it is really hard to imagine like, if I do this change, this is how the pipeline would look like. So much better are tools that are able to, first of all, check the pipeline definition if you have it as a code, check it on your local, whether you don't have some issues in there, and able to display you or prototype the pipeline for you so you will see how the, how the end result will look like before you actually uh, commit it into, into, your, uh, into your repository and it will recreate the pipeline and maybe spoil the pipeline. And one more thing that, that we've learned uh, was that the tool that we've picked, and we haven't realized that, got like, CI definition was always used from the branch in which you committed, but the pipeline definition was taken only from one branch, and you could have selected just one branch which would define the pipeline, which totally makes sense if you have something like a GitHub flow, and you, have, you are only committing to masters, and you have short-lived branches. But if you have Git flow, where you have those, all those different re release branches, that totally changes, uh, changes the way, because the people, they are changing their CI, pushing it, and within that, that CI change, they, they realize that they want to change the pipeline as well, but since the pipeline is actually taken only from one branch, even though they have another branch that like, should have a little bit different pipeline, the changes were not applied, and they were really confused because the CI changes were applied, and the, like, the, the CD changes, the changes for the pipeline weren't, and uh, that, that really, was a, a, a hard thing to tackle to explain how it works and why it works that way, and that we actually need to change from uh, the GitHub flow, uh, sorry, from the Git flow to GitHub flow because that makes much more sense with continuous delivery. Uh, number four is how you can customize that engine. Most of the nowadays engine and engines, and there is a lot of them, like there, there are a lot of startups that are creating those continuous delivery engines uh, because it's really popular nowadays. Um, most of them, they will always like show you the console. And if you want to do something special, you need to spit it up into the console. So look for those that are able to well, there is nothing wrong with the console, to, to be honest. It's just that if your job produces like 10,000 logs files, uh, log lines, it's really hard to find within seconds like what has gone wrong. So much better is looking to something that can give you an overview of the step, and it allows you to actually say from within the step definition, if something goes wrong, you will display this thing or this link on on the top page for the job, so when the developer comes there, he sees right away without having to scroll through those logs and try to uh, find the needle in the haystack, they will right away see w w what's wrong and uh, maybe even what is the remediation that they should apply. Obviously, 
Another good customizability is having the engine should have APIs so you can like talk to them and do something extra if something specific happens. Uh, And the last but not the least is the extensibility. Most of the CI CD engines wouldn't do all the stuff that you might want to do in the future. So look into ones that are having the APIs, uh, are able to give you the ability uh, that from within the, 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 the current step that is running, you are able to see what the step is about, what are its input variables. So you can hook on to that. And, and build the additions on top that are currently missing in, in, in the engine. Uh, this will really help you with moving faster in case the engine doesn't have it, because otherwise, if you don't have the, this extensibility, the only other solution for you is either just sit and wait, which usually isn't good for us software engineers where we want to be better, or you would have to change the, change the engine completely, which can take quite a lot of time if you have uh, so many pe uh, teams already on board it. Okay, uh, I hope you were able to find something uh, valuable, some hidden gem in this, even if it would be just one, uh, that you will be able to take and use in case that you're going to get into, I want to start with continuous delivery. Uh, one gem that is from myself uh, and will always be first in my mind is continuous delivery is not about just getting the pipeline into place and saying we're done. It's about changing how people really think about how they are coding and how they are thinking about deploying their code into production. Thank you. Questions? Good question. Some teams yes, some teams not yet. So I have currently teams that are already, like I told them in the very beginning, we're using Git flow, we need to move to GitHub flow and short-lived branches. And they were like, yeah, 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 that makes total sense. But then they were just using what they were used to because they were used to it and weren't changing that. And I told them, well, it, it's gonna bite you. And now I have teams that are coming and they are saying, we think we need to change the branching model. So I think we are slowly overcoming that and it's different from team to team, if that answers the question. But they need to try, well, I guess they need to try it out, really, to find out uh, that they need to change. They need to experience it, that it's really slowing them down because just telling them didn't help. So you need to, the, they didn't have pipelines, so we provided the pipelines. We found out the ways how to overcome the problems with the different branching model to make it easier for them. And it kind of worked till we got the uh, re release, or how we call it, like 14 days cycles. Now we changed into let's go and have those cycles long uh, length for one day. And then they started to realize it's not working anymore. We need to change that. Does it answer the question? Anyone else? Well, if you have some question later on, feel free to catch me on the, on the corridor somewhere, and I'm definitely eager to talk with you about continuous delivery. Thank you.